Luke, the 14th chapter. Luke chapter 14. You know, um, I have been saying uh, that, I guess of all the sayings that I've, or things that I kind of reiterate ad nausea, is that as a people of God, we need to what? Read. Amen. We need to what? Read. read. And now I want to add something to that. We need to read with understanding. Because it's not just enough for us to read. Um, reading is, as they say, fundamental. Uh, we need to read, but we need to also read with understanding. We need to make sure that what we're reading, that we're not just, uh, uh, the statement is, not just perusing through the scriptures, not just um, you know, it's almost like you can uh, go to a particular park, uh, the Greenway. Uh, we're, we're mostly familiar with that. And the Greenway is a very, <clears throat> very beautiful, laid out uh, park. The scenery is nice. And you could go running through there, go bike riding. And you're like, wow, the scene is beautiful. But then sometimes you might go through there and you may walk. And all of a sudden you start noticing things. You start saying, wow, I never noticed these flowers here. I never noticed this scenery. Um, it's because now it's like you're taking your time and you're able to look and you're noticing things that stand out that didn't stand out before because you were in a hurry for whatever reason. And the same thing when it comes to the word of God, a lot of times we can study the word of God. And, and, and this is something that I have to continually bring my mind back to. And that is not studying to preach, but studying to live learning how to live the things in which we're studying because our lives is the real sermon more so than what is conveyed from the desk is what we do outside of the pulpit that speaks the loudest and sometimes things are going on so much outside of the pulpit that people can't even really hear what's going on inside of it and so we have to as we read the word of god we often we not often but we have to pause and we see God's commands and we see God's admonishings and we have to really stop and ask ourselves, Lord, am I going to do this? Is this me? You know, you could read about Samson, you could read about Judas and you could read about Pharaoh and all these individuals, Esau. And you read all of these things and you say, wow, the Pharisees, wow, what what grave mistakes they make. But we don't take the time to realize that God has put these things on paper parchment so that you and I could meditate and see, Lord, is this my life? Is, is this me? Because we have not only their past, but all the accumulated light till this time that we must look at these things and that we must begin to search our hearts and we must begin to ask ourselves these questions. Lord, who is sufficient for these things? Because I was meditating as I was having a conversation with someone and I said, how many people have and I've and I know people and you probably know people. But how many people have uh, studied things in the Bible only to see them fall victims of it? How many times have we have heard preachers preaching about various subjects that they themselves are falling victims to? And so it's not enough that we just that we're reading the word of God. We must come to it. We must see its promises and we must fall on that rock and be broken. We must realize that, Lord, in myself, I am not capable of doing the least that is said. We are told in inspiration that God chose the smallest test possible for Adam and Eve. An infinite God who inhabits eternity, who has neither beginning of days nor end of life, goes through the vast amount, even if we want to call it knowledge, but, but looks around and says, what is the smallest thing that I can do to prove man's love and in the great controversy? And, that, and so the least of what God is asking us to do in and of ourselves, we are not capable of doing it. And so we must read the word of God and we must constantly, as 
we find various statements and various things that brings conviction, the mind would love to pawn it off on someone else. The mind would love to say, man, this is talking about so-and-so, but not understanding that God is showing us ourselves. So we have to fall on that rock and make sure that we're being broken. But because it says before we would rise, we must first fall. And this is what God is trying to do for us. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. The last time we were together, when we were talking about Jesus, he was invited to uh, the feast at the home of the Pharisee. We mentioned how the Pharisees had brought in a man that had dropsy and set, the, set him right in front of Christ to see what Christ would do, to see if Christ was going to be intimidated because all these other Pharisees and lawyers were in the room, but not understanding that this man, regardless of their purpose, was placed in a position and God was not going to allow an opportunity to pass without fulfilling the mission that he had come to do. Jesus did not allow the pressures of society. He did not allow the, the um, or, or allow what others thought about a particular person or a particular thing to persuade him from not doing what God had sent him into the world to do. And so as they sent this man with dropsy in front of Jesus, Jesus immediately says, uh, uh, he began to talk about things that they would not, that things that they would do on the Sabbath because they had, they had burdened down God's requirements with their own man-made ideas and standards that even in a lifetime, one could not fulfill all of the requirements of the church. And many had toiled to the point of death, trying to fulfill everything that was laid out by the church and to add insult to injury, those who had made these laws were themselves not keeping them. And so as this man was sat there, Jesus healed this man of his dropsy. And then while he's there, he then turns to them and he says, listen, as a matter of fact, when you call a feast, don't call all of your rich neighbors. Don't call those whom you are accustomed and feel comfortable around. Because again, by the very atmosphere of the room that Jesus was looking into, this is not what heaven is going to look like. It's not going to be made up of people who are comfortable around each other. It's not going to be made up of people, well, I, I invited this person because this is the person I like, or I'm willing to fellowship with this people because these are the people I like. But Christ was showing that your real purpose of being established is not being accomplished. And he's showing them by the very atmosphere of those that they had invited to their homes for this feast was indicative uh, that they had lost their real desire and purpose for the reason God had brought them up. See, when you date, go back to Abraham, God separated Abraham from his family for what purpose? To be a blessing. To, be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Because darkness had come, had settled upon the face after the flood once again. All that was done at the Tower of Babel had now disseminated out into the world. And so now God raises up Abraham and he sends Abraham out as it were, as a messenger, as a light bearer to go to all the various nations of the world and to carry to them the true knowledge of God. And so everybody that Abraham found himself around, he was to impart to them light and power and that they would see this light and power and would be drawn to Christ. This was his purpose. And this was the purpose that God had established Jerusalem. It was to be the city of peace. It was to be, as it were, a city of refuge that the righteous could, that the, the righteous as well as the, 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 the worldling could run into and be safe. This was the purpose that God had established them. And this is the purpose that God has established us. All of us, brothers and sisters, have been called for such a time as this. 
But we have to understand what is our mission and what is our purpose. And we must ask God for the Holy Spirit that we might be endowed with his power to fulfill that purpose. And here Christ begins to give a parable in Luke chapter 14, and he's describing the mission, the purpose that they were called, and also to show them that they were on the verge of being rejected. Notice, brothers and sisters, what the Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 14. You should be there now. Luke chapter 14. Let's uh, start in verse 15. Luke chapter 14, and we're looking at verse 15, and when you have it, amen. Notice what it says. The Bible says, matter of fact, jump back to verse 12. Let's just look at verse 12 again. Uh, we looked at this the last time we were together, but let's look at it again. It says, then said he also to him that bade him or, or the one that invited him. He says, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, nor thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again and a recompense be made. But when thou makest a feast, do what? Call the poor and the maim, the lame and the blind. Verse 14, and thou shalt be blessed for they cannot do what? Recompense thee for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. So God was telling them that their purpose in calling them is understanding that, there, that there's not to be some recompense, there's not to be some earthly glory to be, come, to be received as a result of inviting these individuals. In other words, you are gonna have to act, as it were, go into your pockets. You are gonna have to draw upon your means to satisfy the needs of these individuals because they have nothing by which to pay thee. When you look at the, it's in Luke chapter 11. Hold your finger here. Jump back to Luke chapter 11. Jump back to Luke chapter 11 and notice what Jesus says in this, as he's speaking concerning prayer. In Luke uh, chapter 11, and notice what it says beginning at verse 5. Luke 11, beginning at verse 5, he says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and shall say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is what? Come to me, and I have what? Nothing to set before him. Now, God is using this to symbolize our pleading for the Holy Spirit. When we begin to recognize the needs of humanity, we will begin to recognize our insufficient capabilities to satisfy what they really need. When God brings us in contact with humanity, and you begin to talk to someone, you start realizing, you know what? I don't have the resources to impart to this individual in order to bring them to a place of stability, I have to now seek out others to help me in this endeavor. But we are not to go to earthly individuals. We ought to turn to who? God. We ought to turn to God. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah 58, go with me there. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Now, brothers and sisters, we can experience this now to a great degree, but we're going to see this experience even more as laws become more strict. And when we began to see our finances, our resources, and our ability to move freely becoming more and more restricted. In the pretext of keeping society safe, but we understand that, the, that Satan is at war with the woman. And he is making war with the church of God. Those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. But as we see our liberties being eroded and taken from us, 
those who would stand in freedom of conscience are going to see their religious freedoms being removed from them. And we are going to find our resources being taken away from us and all our dependence will be on God. But we must not wait for that time to come. We must now begin to exercise faith. Because in that particular time, we are told that we are going to need a faith that can endure weariness, hunger, delay. But if we have not been building up our most holy faith, then guess what? In that time, we're not going to have faith. In that time, we're going to do what we think is best in order to relieve ourselves of this delay, of this hunger. So God want, is putting the church in a position where they can see God's power being worked even now, and not just as a church at large, individuals. Individuals. When God called Abraham, yes, Abraham was the foundation for the church, but Abraham was one family. God called one family to be a blessing to the entire world. And as he multiplied, his family grew. But it started with one household. We are told that if one saint were right, he could move the arm of God, while a multitude together, if they were wrong, could do nothing. So as we look at the Bible, civilization started with how many families? One family. So brothers and sisters, again, understand when we look at our individual households, when we think of the church, it starts with the family. If revival and reformation does not begin in the home, guess what? It will not affect the body as a, at large. If the only time we're willing to do right is when we come here, then it won't affect anything. The reforms and the, 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 pardon me, the revival and the reformation must begin in the home. Its effect is seen in the church. If it's not seen in the church, it's because it's not being enacted in the homes. Are we together? That's where it has to start. So what we talk about here, it must go back and affect our individual homes. The idols in our homes have to be torn down. Rules of, of, of regulation of God being in our lives consistently, it must begin in the home so that its effect happens in the church. Notice, here we are in Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, when this, when the church is coming together and their purpose, they're praying, Isaiah says they're praying for the purpose of smiting with the fist. They're praying for the purpose of putting forth their agenda and they, they want to be recognized in society as the people of God. They want to be able to fly their banners in the courthouses. They want to be able to fly their banners in the schools. They want to be able to fly their banners in society. And so they're coming together on these National Day of Prayers. They're coming together and they're putting their religious agenda. They are seeking government offices for the purpose of establishing themselves as a credible uh, uh, entity in society. This is what they're doing in the first part of Isaiah 58. But God says, listen. This is not the fast that I've chosen. This is, not, this is not what I've called the church to do. I've given you a mission. I've given you a purpose. I was looking, I was looking at a testimony of a man who used to be um, a white supremacist. He was, he was a KKK. And they said, what caused you to change? He said, a preacher did. He said, how? He said, he said, it was, he said, he said I'm laughing. He said, but it was interesting how it happened. He said, you know, we, 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 we burned this church. And he says, when he came out there and he saw us with the cross and he said, and he, uh, while we had our sheets on, he said, uh, he knew him by name. So he said, is that you? He said, man, I've been, I've been praying for you. And he said, he walked away. They was upset. And then all of a sudden he said, he walked into the, uh, he was sitting there one day eating. He said, he walked into the restaurant, he saw him there. And he said, they all surrounded him 
And he said, the man was about to eat. And he said, he looked at the man, he said, listen here. He said, whatever you do to that sandwich, we're going to do to you. And he said, he looked up and he kissed the sandwich. And he said, all you heard was. Mm. And he said, we all had to ran, run out of the place to stop laughing. And he said, we got outside. He said, what are y'all laughing at? He said, but regardless of what they did to him, he would always respond differently. And his response and the way he responded showed him the foolishness of what he was doing. And he was saying that this man's religion did more to, did more to disrupt our movement than all protests could have ever done because it changed his life. So what the world is trying to do to affect change is not what God has given to us as a church to affect change. So now, brothers and sisters, when we think about Isaiah 58, it's not just enough for us to read it and know that this is what it is. We have to ask God how. How, if this is the fast that you have chosen, then Lord, how do I participate in this fast? How do I be a part of this movement? Because we can read it, we know it, we recite it, we show it in prophecy, and yet we are not having the experience of it. Because we're waiting for someone else to do it that we might tag on with it. Notice what it says in Isaiah 58. Very quickly, Isaiah 58, God tells us in verse um, uh, 6, the Bible says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the what? Loose the bands of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens and to let the what? Oppressed go free. And that ye break what? Watch this, verse 7. Is it not to deal what? Thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to what? When thou seest the naked, that thou take him to your church, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thine cell from what? All right. Now, all of this that God had mentioned to us in verse 7 is all personal. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? So now this is speaking of our food, but we also call money bread, don't we? Well, we used to. We used to call it bread. But the reality is, if you go here, let's move quickly. Go to Luke. Go to Luke chapter 10. Luke, the 10th chapter. Luke, notice what it says. Luke 10. This is the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10. And here we are in Luke chapter 10. The story of the Good Samaritan, starting at verse 30, ending down in uh, verse 37. But I want to focus on verse 33. Luke 10, beginning at verse 33, the object of what it means to truly keep the law of God as loving our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus actually puts life onto this doctrinal teaching. It is a true doctrinal teaching, but God shows us how it becomes a living reality. How do we show individuals that God's law, that we believe that God's law is still binding? Not by the doctrines we preach, but by the way in which we live shows that the doctrine is valid. Are you with me? Because if we don't live it, then the doctrine has no life. The Bible says that, that Christ, uh, uh, it says the word became what? Flesh. The living, the reality that God's word can have power in our lives was demonstrated through the life of Christ. How will they know that the law of God is still binding by the way in which we live our lives? So it says, 
because it actually starts in verse 25 when they talk about the law, but here it is in verse 33. It says, but a certain man, the good Samaritan was on his way and he was accosted by thieves. He lost everything and God in his providence brought the church. First brought what happened to this man. He brought the attention of it first to the church. He wanted the church to see the need and he, God had provided the church with the ability to fulfill the need so that the world would see the church's good works and they would glorify who? Their father in heaven. So God providentially brought the church, brought this need first to the church. And we see that the church walked past it. The church didn't, didn't, didn't want it. Church left it alone. You know, brothers and sisters, in the 1800s, what is now called the Bible Belt, God intended that his light and his message would be known all throughout the South before, uh, uh, before it became what it is today. God intended, there's a book called Southern Works. Little, little booklet, you should get that book. You should get that book and read it. And if you read that book, it will actually show you practically what you can be doing right now in this hyper uh, 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 society of all these different things that we're dealing with. But God brought the attention of what happened in the South after the Civil War to the attention of the church first. And the church walked by on the other side. And God raised up a man called Edson White and became like the Good Samaritan. So just because we see the work being neglected by a great majority, it doesn't mean that we have to neglect what God brings in our path. Amen. We may not be able to be able to go out throughout all the world and save all of humanity. And oh, look at what they're doing with all their what they're not doing with all these billions of dollars. They will have to answer to that. But what are you doing with the three hundred dollars I've given you? Because you're not going to have to give an account for $2 billion in tithe. Amen. You're going to have to give an account for that check you get every month or every week. Amen. You're going to have to give an account for your mileage that you put on your car. That's what you're going to have to give an account to God for. Not for what everyone is not doing. And so here the Good Samaritan comes and the Good Samaritan sees that this man is in this condition and he could have walked by. He said, hey, man, I'm not as rich as the church. Matter of fact, I'm on my way to do something. But what does he do? Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, what did he do? Compassion on him. And went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in what? Oil and what? Wine. And what did he do? Set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn, and did what? And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the hopes, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will what? All right. This man, this oil and his wine, do you think this man actually made provision to share this as he was leaving his home? Not to say that he wasn't going to, because you see, he did. But when he was packing up his stuff, maybe this had to do with his lunch. Maybe some, he was going to do something with it. Maybe he was going to find something and cook it. But the reality is, when he left home, he wasn't thinking he was going to find a thief on the... On the he, he didn't think he was going to find some poor person on the street. But when he went... And he saw a need, he immediately did not think about, oh, I only have enough of myself. He immediately took what he had and applied it to the situation. And then to go a step further, he did not take him to the church because he knew this man was a Jew. His, he knew the man just like, well, I won't go there. But anyway, he knew the man was a Jew and he came put him on his own beast. He didn't take him to the local synagogue, did he? No. Hmm. He took him to somewhere where he knew he would be cared for. Because the Samaritan wouldn't have been accepted at the synagogue. So he took him to this inn. 
all night took care of him. The next morning, he says, I must continue to go on. However, take care of him. But whatever you spend more, when I come back, I'll what? I'll repay thee. It wasn't in my budget, but may God be praised. And he said, I will repay thee. This was personal effort that was put in to the saving of this man. And this, this made such an impact on Jesus that Jesus says, that is what my mission is. So much so that Jesus looked at the church and says, do what these Samaritans are doing. These people that you, will, that you believe will never be able to finish the work or doesn't have the experience to preach the, the message, God says, do what they're doing. Do thou likewise. And do we not see individuals to a degree doing what God has called the church to do? Sure. Do we not see new agers and all these different people doing things that the church should be doing? So God says, go and do likewise. He's not asking us to follow the example in worshiping trees and worshiping nature, but the work that they are doing, this is the work that God has called for his people to do. We have to understand what that work is. And it is the salvation of souls. Salvation of souls, again, is not just preaching by itself. It's by showing the power of God, because as they see your works, they begin to inquire, why are you doing this? What, why, are you, why are you going to such great lengths? You can now direct them to your source of inspiration. And they will begin to understand whose we are and why we're doing what we're doing. And so now, brothers and sisters, when these individuals began to hear on the television of these people that are being destroyed by the media, they will say, that's not true. I don't believe that. I don't believe that about all of them. Why? Because I met one. There was, they, they were in my home. And this is not how they acted. But if we are not in society, all of a sudden, when the media starts their barrage of, dis of trying to tear down the work of God, then we want to try to go out in public. It's not going to work. God is calling for us this and to be active at this very moment. Notice, let's go back to Luke 14. Let's go back to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14 God says we are going to be recompensed in the resurrection. You could add Matthew chapter 25. When Jesus came to the sheep and he looked at them. And remember, you have, you have Matthew 25. You also have Matthew 7 where God says, Not everyone that saith unto me, what? Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that, what? Doeth. He that, what? Doeth the will of my Father. Not everyone that's saying, Lord, Lord, is getting in, but he that does. Remember, they, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out devils? Lord, we did many wonderful works. They did it with a purpose of a selfish motive. And God did not recognize their prophesying. He did not recognize their miracles. He did not recognize all the many wonderful things that they were doing in society. God did not recognize it because they were doing it for themselves. They only wanted, they only did it when the camera was there. It's amazing, brothers and sisters, how you're able to find, I'm like, how did someone know that he was going to go and help that poor person? Where'd that camera come from? Why? I mean, like, how is everybody being filmed helping poor people now? I'm like, this is amazing to me. I'm like, where did they get the mic from? Everybody that's doing something in society, there's a camera around. Wow. It's acting, brothers and sisters. Amen. It's, 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 it's an act. Everyone has a selfie stick putting money in poor people's cups. It's an act. Lord, didn't we not do wonderful works? 
Lord said, you got your likes already. You know, you, you, you got the view. You got everything you want, everything you was after, you got it. That's not what I was after. I wasn't after the photo op of you doing a Bible study. I was not after the photo op of you handing out this. and hand, I wasn't after the photo op. I was after the heart. I wanted them to be saved. You wanted the photo op. You got it. Praise God. Well, praise a God. But the reality is, brothers and sisters, God is looking for a work that he can, that he can acknowledge in when it's in the, res, in the resurrection. Because in Matthew 25, it says, those on the right, the sheep, he says, come in. For when I was a hungered, you did this. And I was sick and I was in prison and you visited me. And, and I was naked and you clothed me. And they say, Lord, when did we see thee? As you've done it unto the what? Least. Least of these, my brethren. You've done it unto me. Because every soul you went to, you did it as if you was doing it to me. You were actually, you were actually training your children as if you was training Christ in your home to rule the, to, 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 to do what he did in the world. That's one thing as parents we have to ask ourselves, what if God would have given Jesus to us? What if God said, you know what? What if God sent Jesus to live in your home? What type of habits would Christ have if he was living in your home? And this is parents. What type of habits would he have? As children, what type of sibling would you have been to Jesus? How would you treat Christ? if he was your brother and sister in your home. The way we treat our brothers and sisters now is how we would treat Jesus. The way we treat our children now, it shows that we're not preparing them for the cross. We're not preparing them to be a saver of life. We want them to be educated. We want them to be prosperous. And we're neglecting that which they can take with them into the new world. Says in Luke 14, Luke 14. Here's this parable in Luke 14, verse 15. Are we still together? Luke 14, verse 15. It says, and when one of them sat, this is Jesus, Jesus just told them when, that, when, you're, in a, when you're gonna invite people, don't, in, he told them who not to invite. But there's one here who tried to turn the conversation. He says, and there was one that sat at meat and heard these things. And he said unto him, what? Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the one. In other words, he, he, he almost said it. He heard what Christ said and the conviction began to settle. He blurted out, hey, blessed, hey, blessed is he that eateth in the kingdom of the Lord. And when you look in Christ's object lesson, she likens this to the same statement where Balaam said, Oh, that I might die the death of the righteous when he wasn't willing to live the life of the righteous. He wanted the reward of heaven, but he wasn't willing to live as though he wanted to be there. And Jesus turns now and Jesus hears this and Jesus is beginning to show him you're about to be out. You don't even realize that you are in a position where God is about to pronounce that you will no longer be afforded the privileges that you have had and wasted. And he goes on and he says in verse 16, then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. And he sent his servants and he sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, do what? Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to do what? Make excuses. The first said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, 
have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house began being angry, said to his servants, go out quickly into the, into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maim and the halt and the blind. Now skip down to verse 24, what he says. For I say unto you that none of those men which were what? Bidden shall taste of my supper. Hold your finger there and go in your Bible to the book of Acts 13. Acts chapter 13. This invitation to the supper is the gospel invitation. It is the invitation to receive the work and the life of Christ. It is a gospel invitation. And what it is signifying is that those that were sitting there at the feast were rejecting the opportunity that God was given to them to associate closely with him in his work. Yes. The Jewish nation, brothers and sisters, was cutting themselves off. And God says, those that were first bidden will not taste of this supper. Notice what it says. Notice what it says in the book of, you're in Acts 13, right? Acts 13, look at verse 46. Acts 13, look at verse 46. Reading down to verse 48. The Bible says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should have been spoken to you. He's speaking to the Jews. But seeing you do what? You put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of what? Everlasting. Everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Wait a minute. You judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life. How is everlasting life obtained? God says he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should not perish but have everlasting. everlasting life. The Bible tells us in the book of uh, Matthew. Go with me to Matthew. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. God had sent a message to the Jews, to that generation, and they were turning their backs on that which God had given to them. Why? Because they felt that they were the chosen people of God and they needed no such message. They were already in the church. They were Abraham's seed, as it were. They had every earthly connection that would make them the favorite people of God. And therefore, when the message came to them, they spurned it because they said, we're already the chosen people of God. This message is not for us. Yes, we can use a bit of a modification here and there, a little tweaking here, and a little tweaking there, but there's no need of any, of any extreme repentance. There's no need of, any, any of us going to any extreme measures with the people of God. This message is not for us. That's why in Luke 4, when Jesus grabbed, when they gave him the book, Jesus opened to the book of Isaiah and he began to read about that, that the Messiah would come and with the spirit and power of the Lord to the main, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. And then he gave them back the book. And then he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And they said, whoa, whoa, hold up. Are you implying that we're under some yoke? That we need deliverance? And they ran Jesus out of the church. They were not satisfied with putting him out of the building. They actually took him to the cliff to throw him off. They were so, they were so offended that you would reference them as being in a lost condition. 
But notice what John the Baptist says in, in, in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, brothers and sisters, notice what it says. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Matthew chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for what? Meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves that we have 1844. Think not to say within yourselves that we have the prophecies, that we are the people of prophecy. You cannot use your earthly connection to all of these various events to signify that you're God's people. Now here it says, Abraham, say not within yourselves, we have Abraham. But we're not talking about the Jews right now. We don't date our, we don't date our existence to Abraham, do we? We, we date it to the Millerite movement. We date it to the end of the 2300 day prophecy. Amen. We date it to a people of prophecy that God has raised us up to continue the reformation. We have seen the mighty workings of God in the movement of, in this movement of destiny. And yet God is telling us as he says to Laodicea, because Laodicea applies to us, that we are in a position where we have to repent. Yes. Repentance does not mean moving our membership from one, den one congregation to another. Are you with me? That's not repentance, brothers and sisters. You have just moved. You have just, hey, I, 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 I'll associate over here. But moving your membership from one building to another is not repentance. You have to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Go to 2 Corinthians. Go with me to 2 Corinthians, have mercy, chapter 6. 2 Corinthians, chapter 6. Notice what the Bible... Hmm. No, it's not. Hold on, hold on. Don't, don't, don't hold me to that one. Uh, I believe it's chapter 7. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. Uh, chapter 7. Chapter 6, he's telling them that they cannot be uh, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he's talking about how can light and darkness dwell together? How can Christ and Billy Al be on one accord? He says, no, these things... Is it, it, it must not be in the life of the true Christian. And now he says, and he goes over and he's telling them that this is, they, in other words, they have to break off these earthly connections, these things that, that, that hold them in the, 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 the collapse of Satan. And then it says in chapter 7 now, chapter 7, I want us to look over here in verse 8, chapter 7, look at verse 8. And notice what it says. It says, for though, now watch this, for though I made you what? Sorry with a letter. I do not repent, though I did. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you what? Sorry. Though it, what, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to what? Repent. All right. So now, this is the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God to bring conviction in the life. That's the Word of God working through His messengers and bringing conviction to our lives that we are not where we ought to be with Christ. <clears throat> Why are we not where we ought to be? Because our standards are too low. How our standards too low is because we, too many, we often measure ourselves among ourselves. You know, the analogy is, as long as I'm ahead of you, I believe I'm okay. As long as I see you still, quote unquote, stumbling and falling, and I'm over here, I measure my success by where you're not. 
only to realize that I get to the quote unquote finish line to realize that I had the wrong standard. Christ was the standard. And Christ was not measuring them by your standard. Christ was measuring them on his own by his standard that he had set up. And so what happens is in the garden of God, we cannot look at the shrubs and we look at the flowers over here and we say, well, wow, why is that flower getting as big as these bushes? It's not intended to. God recognizes what he has put in every man and he is measuring us by his divine standard. And therefore we must encourage people in Christ, but we must hold the standard of the word of God. Remember, God says reprove with all long suffering and doctrine, making sure that our reproof is according to the word of God and not according to where I just don't like this. You know, sometimes when we can't get something, we don't want others to get it either. And you, you see this a lot with children. I'm not trying to put my children out there, but the reality is, hey, what are you doing with that bread? Daddy said I can have some. Daddy, yes. Can I get a piece of bread? But they were just over there arguing, trying to stop this one from getting it. Not because they shouldn't have had it. They didn't have it. Are you with me? And we tend to do the same thing. We can do the same thing, brothers and sisters. We can lift up standards only because we don't want someone else to be where we're not. But we must allow the standards to be lifted to give God glory. Not to hold people back. The standards have to be there for what is right. And so we have to constantly make sure that Lord checking our motives for what we're doing in the name of the Lord. That we're not driving people away, but that we're setting examples so that people can see, yes, I see what God is doing through you and as a motivation to keep running. And we keep encouraging people to come along as we're praying. But yes, the standard, we don't set it. It's not ours. God has made the standard. And by his grace, as we fall at his feet, then God will give us the strength to uphold that which he has given us to do. But Satan, if we, it's not even about not being careful. It's about recognizing that in and of ourselves, we cannot trust ourselves. Our mind is not our ally. We must trust to the word of God. And what can start out, brothers and sisters, as an innocent friendship can end up being something that will enthrall us. Yes. We have to allow God to give us strength and barriers. We have to ask God, Lord, help me, hold me, because you cannot trust yourself. He says, he says, I'm glad. I'm rejoicing that you have been made sorry. Not because you were sorrowful. He says, but that sorrow only lasted for a season. But this sorrow led to what? It led to repentance. So yes, you'll hear things from the preacher. Yes, you'll read things in the word of God that rubs you the wrong way. Yes, you'll hear it and you'll say, wow, man, I did not want to hear that. And it will bring about sorrow, but if you continue to follow on to know the Lord, it will turn into rejoicing. Amen. But what will it create? Notice what he says going on. He says, now I rejoice not that you made you sorry, but that you sorrow to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage of us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to what? Not to be repented of but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what, what does that say? Carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what? Clearing of yourselves, yea, what? Indignation, yea, what? Fear, and what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, what revenge, and all these in all things you have approved yourselves to be what? Clear in this matter. Back up. Notice. 
you sorrow to a godly sword, and notice what it says, what? Carefulness. Meaning that now when it comes to making choices, I have to be extremely careful. I can't trust myself. I have to make sure that others, I have to make sure that in a multitude of godly counsel, there's wisdom. So now I have to make sure that I'm doing everything because I know the tendency that I have to go off in a tangent. Because now my future course truly shows that I've repented and learned from that mistake. Amen. It was a mistake, but I've gained a great victory if I recognize it to be a mistake. But if we continue to sorrow because, we, because we're convicted about sin, it will bring about death. Because eventually we will go back, we will drift back into that life. And we might deaden our senses to the Spirit of God. Notice, it says what carefulness and what clearing of yourselves, you put yourself in a position where you will not be identified with that thing anymore. It's over. The relationship is over. And guess what? No, you don't see me with that person. Why? Because it's over. If you're not careful, you will end up back in that thing. It says, Yea, what indignation, your, your, you, 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 you hate the fact that Satan was able to lead you into that situation and you are determined not to be there again. It says, what a vehement desire, yea, what zeal and what revenge. In other words, you are now redeeming the time by doing what is right. Amen. Yes. You're redeeming the time by doing what is right. Notice, so here, when we're talking about repentance, we're not just talking about some intellectual ascents. We're not just talking about uh, changing of addresses. We're talking about the changing of behavior. The behavior has to change because if you go from one address to another and the behavior is still the same, then there's no repentance. There's no repentance. And this is what often happens when people quote unquote, leave conferences and go to non-conference churches, that to them is a sign of repentance. And it's not. Because everybody doesn't leave for the same reason. Somebody have left for one reason or another, but guess what? When they don't get their way here, they eventually say, you know, the Lord is telling me to go back. Lord is, yeah, I believe the Lord wants me back over here. Just wait for the other shoe to drop. And you'll eventually find out why they believe the Lord is telling them to go back. It will eventually show itself. And so, the, but the reality is, we understand, or we're understanding, is that God is, that God has a purpose and a mission for us to do. There's something that God wants to accomplish. And so God creates environments, not for the purpose of saying, look at what they don't have. God is, wants us to be an example or in a situation so that we can fulfill the commission that he is giving us and the invitation that the world has to receive. And by God's grace, maybe some of those who are fighting against it will see the power in it. Like Nicodemus, he was not that he fought it, but he wasn't willing to break away. You had Joseph of Arimathea. You had Paul that fought against it. The Bible says many of the Pharisees, guess what? They joined the movement. Yes. Why? Because they saw in it the power of God. Amen. They saw that these cursing sailors have mercy, were humble now. They were no longer the sons of thunder. They were the sons of God. They had, they didn't lose their zeal to do the will of God, but their humble, contrite spirit showed them that there's something to Gamaliel, as smart as he was, had enough sense to say, leave these men alone. Says there's not, there's, there's something not, this is no ordinary movement. And if you notice, he listed various movements of reformation that filtered, that, that, that filtered out. They became nothing. He says, but there's something we have to be careful 
that we're not fighting against God on this one. Why? Not because of just what they're saying, but what they're doing. There is a power that is attending this work. Are you with me? Yes. So there has to be a power that is attending us, and the power is going to attend us when we are in a position where the Spirit of God can be breathed on us. Amen. And what did Christ tell Peter? He says, Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. When thou art converted. Guess what, brothers and sisters? Let's go back to Luke. We're in here. and We'll put a pin in it. In this gospel invitation, brothers and sisters, this will be set in motion. Because remember, look at what it says in verse 17. Verse 17. And he sent his servants at what? At supper time. To say to them that were bidden, what? Come, for all things are now ready. Next week, we are going to show by God's grace how this relates to Revelation 14 and Revelation 18. Okay, it's a prelude to next week. Revelation 14, Revelation 18. How does this correlate with it? Because believe it or not, we are not at the first call. Neither the second call, we're at the final call. We're at the final invitation that God has given to the world. The, re the thing is that we have to understand is this. In verse 17, he says this, and he sent his servants at what? Supper. Supper time. To say unto them that were bidding, come for all things are now. All right. So those who went out, went out with a particular message. And what was the message? All come, all things are ready. That indicates to us that these servants had to have a knowledge of the times. They did not, they could not go out with this, this inconsistent um, um, message of not being confident of what they were doing. They had to know that the message that they was bearing was the right message. Because the, the, the one who put the feast together said, tell them that all things are ready. These servants had to understand that all things were ready. Brothers and sisters, the thing that we have to ask ourselves, are we can we, with, with, without any hesitancy, tell the world that all things are ready? Will there be a discrepancy in the message and the messenger? Will they hear what you're saying, but look at what you're doing and not see the urgency of what you're saying? Is that possible? If I came, someone came to this room and said, man, there's a fire outside. And they came in here and sat down. And he said it again. Eventually, we would ask some of the brothers, can you take him out? Because we would think something was wrong with him. Because if it was that urgent, why would you be sitting down? Are you with me? If there was such an urgency... And if the fire was so raging, why are you sitting down? There is no sense of urgency in what you're saying. And therefore, you don't even believe what you're saying. And why should I believe what you're saying? We say, brothers and sisters, that we're living in the last days, but are there corresponding works in what we're doing? When we look at, when you look at your future plans of your life, does your life plans coincide with what you believe? Because if your plans doesn't coincide with the last days that you say we believe we're living in, then that means you don't believe it. But if it coincides with it, then we must be living like that. 
Our plans have to coincide. Lord, I, I believe that all things are ready. I believe it. And I believe that this is the final invitation. And if I believe that, then do the people that I associate with know that I believe that? Do they realize that I believe that we're living in the last days? We were reading the children's lesson about Brother Whitefield, and it was asked by a reporter, do you believe his message? And his response was, no, but he does. Let that sink in for a moment. I don't believe it, but he believes it. How? By the way he lives. By what he does, I can tell he believes what he's preaching. And so when people find out who you are, does it resonate with what they have seen of you up until that time? Because when they find out who you are, the only thing they have as a reference point is what you what? Will do or what you have done? What you have done. And so when they hear, oh, you're... Will they have to be like, oh. And walk and go on because that's not what they have heard about God's remnant people. And so this is, it gets to a point now we have to start again examining ourselves. Lord, is it better for me? Has it, think about it. Has my life been made better by my attendance of this church? Has my life been made better by all the things that God, that we believe that God is doing? Has my life been made better as a result of it? Are my choices corresponding with what I profess to believe? If it doesn't, then brothers and sisters, we have to start examining ourselves. Because I encourage anybody, every one of us, brothers and sisters, you must be in a place where your soul and, your, and your, where you are being edified, where you are being strengthened, where you're being enlightened, where you're being urged and provoked to do what is right in the sight of God. Because we are going to have to give an account for all that God has blessed us with. And it's like the more you read and the more you learn, the more you just keep saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And, it's, and chances are, as a whole, a lot of the things that we have heard is not as though we have not known it before. If you go back and look at a lot of your books, you're like, wow. I marked it. I circled it. I even put a little note there. And if I was judged alone on this passage that I underlined what I've gotten in, you go back and look at some of the stuff you underlined, you're like, Lord have mercy. I read that. Yes, you marked it. And you're still not doing it. So we're reading but not with understanding. I've known people, brothers and sisters, that went through Adventist home and still made a wrong decision about their marriage. I mean, people reading, and I say this because I know this person probably is not watching this, and I'm not going to mention their name, but someone called me and they said, hey, I need you to talk with this brother. I said, okay, let's talk. We got on the phone, started talking, things came out. I said, listen, and the person that called said, he said, well, I'm praying. And she said, you doing what? I said, you praying about what? What is there to pray about? This is what it says. What do you mean you praying about it? She says, you're the pastor. And if you make this bad decision, what do you think that's going to say about everybody else in the church? Guess what? They still went ahead with it. Still went ahead with it. So the reality is, I'm saying that, to say, and it doesn't mean just about relationships. It could be about anything. We're reading it and then go and do the exact opposite. Lord, give me what? Understanding. Lord, I need understanding as I'm reading. 
I see it as plain as day, dear Lord, but the reality of it is not my will, because I don't want to do this. But let what? Thy will be done. Let thy will be done. As parents, we set the example. When we have to make decisions and we have to change, that's a testimony to our children. We have to say, you know what, man, praise God. They say, what? You tell them about a decision you had to make and what you realize that God convicted you and you fought it, but you surrendered. And now you have to go in this direction. That resonates as a, as a, as a marker in their mind so that when they're confronted with the decision, they have that, the Holy Spirit has that as a reference point and they're able to go back to that testimony and the Spirit of God will say, do thou likewise. And then they will come to you and testify, mom, dad, remember you were talking, the Lord, and they're able to share and you're able to rejoice together in the experience. But we can't expect them to make decisions of sacrifices and they see us compromising. We have to make those decisions. We have to lay these things out. We have to tell them where we went wrong. We have to show them how God is now leading us and though I made this mistake, you have to ask God to give you strength. Because children are not from Mars and parents from Venus. Those chromosomes, they came from somebody. They are made up of us. And so a lot of what they struggle with is, is inherited. And what they cultivated, it was on the back of what we gave them. So we have to be even more patient, loving, and, and persistent in our godly corrections in their life and in our own. Because God is going to say to all of us, where is your flock? Where is that flock? And we want to be able to say, Lord, here they are. We want to be able to say that, brothers and sisters. God wants us to be able to say that. The beautiful thing, Jesus sets an example for us. We close on this. Jesus says, Lord, all that thou hast given me, I have kept. Save one. Son of perdition. Because he refused to surrender to the Holy Ghost. It pained him to see one of his children lost. 